acknowledged as a result of all of our studies that the New Testament does invoke the New Covenant and Jesus came to bring a New Covenant and that New Covenant does not carry with it the rules and regulations of the old. They are simply done away. The Lord of the Sabbath has come and the reality has replaced the shadow. The whole package was set aside and replaced by Jesus Christ. Salvation is a gift and it means that you cannot earn it in any way, shape or form. We are a new covenant church. Our relationship with God is based on faith in Christ and not on the Old Covenant. The Old Covenant is obsolete. That was the shot heard round the world. It was a showdown. It was a Dodge City, high noon. <laughs> it was the uh, OK Corral. When you have been a Sabbatarian and you hear done away, it, 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 there's nothing more shocking. Nothing more shocking to your ears to say, the Sabbath is not required for Christians, is just like a clanging bell in your ears. You know, no, that can't be. I've been, for all these years, I believe, I believe it required, you had to do it. When he said that the rest is in Christ, not in a 24-hour period of time. People just, just, smoke came out of people's ears. Their fuses were blowing. <laughs> And uh, so it was an enormous conflict in the Worldwide Church of God. I was a pastor in South Africa when Joseph Takash said that the Sabbath was not demanded of Christians. It had a devastating effect on the church. This was catastrophic uh, because it challenged everything that I'd believed for 30 years. He must have been totally convicted to go that far because uh, predictably it, it was like a nuclear explosion that went off in the church. For, for Mr. Dukach to make such a statement about the Christian Sabbath that's totally, you know, diametrically opposite of what the church had taught for 50, 60 years. Well, members were uneasy about that because here's an apostle contradicting another apostle. Somebody's got to be wrong. After the service broke up, people were huddled in crowds. And people were in tears and some people were angry and people were talking. What does this mean? What's the significance of this? I remember sitting wide-eyed in church listening to him that day and just very, very aware that things were changing that these were not little changes, little doctrinal changes, that this was big. I remember walking back to my dorm and all of, all of the students were just kind of in a daze. And I remember kids on the phones to their parents at their, in their home congregations, did you hear about this? What does that mean? You know, and, and, and pretty quickly there was a, a comparing of, of stories. What have you heard? It would have been a good time to own stock in the telephone company because the phone lines were burning all over in our congregations, not just in the U.S., but all over the world. And, uh, and that, that's what began uh, the uh, momentum of change. Mr. Dukacha's sermon and some of the announcements were sent out worldwide via email. It became pretty bumpy pretty fast. Some loved it, some didn't, some were happy, some were not, some were saying, I can accept this, some were saying, I can't. The irony of it was people were saying literally something to the effect that we've always kept the Sabbath, we've always believed the Sabbath must be kept, we must obey God. He's saying we don't have to obey God, we don't have to keep the Sabbath, that can't be right. He's saying we don't have to keep the festivals. We've always been taught we have to keep the festivals to obey God. If we don't keep the festivals, we're sinning, and yet he says that we don't have to keep them anymore, that can't be right. He says that we don't have to tithe our money to the church anymore. That makes a lot of sense. And the first thing that happened, no matter what side of the ideology you were on, is the income of the church took a nosedive. Just like an airplane going down. Uh, and the graph is pretty dramatic when you see it in, in visual form of, uh, of what happened in 1995. Well, if you're an employee, and I was a supervisor, I had people under me, um, uh, cutbacks. Well, you got 
you're laying off people that have been working there 20, 30 years. Uh, my wife was laid off. Um, Media operations, the particular division that I was involved in, went from about a thousand employees down to, what are we now, 10? We had to manage uh, a, an organization in financial crisis as well as emotional crisis uh, with doctrinal changes that were impacted by that sermon. But how to take an organization from cultic standing <laughs> and move it into the body of Christ, how do you do that? And it was all we could do to keep up with the questions that one change would raise that would lead to another because the implications of one thing generally impacted other issues. And so we found ourselves on a runaway train. <laughs> and it's not like we were driving the train. Um, it's as if someone put a brick on the accelerator and we were all just hanging onto the train doing the best, best we could. The sacrifice uh, to the church itself in terms of membership uh, was tremendous. The, uh, going into these changes, the church had approximately 150,000 members and coming out the other side, uh, when all is said and done, there were only a, a little less than 60,000 left. And uh, those, many of those went to splinter groups. Our fellowship was devastated. It was fragmented. It was shattered. And the majority left. So I can't say that the majority held the Word of God above the doctrines of Herbert Armstrong. Those who wound up staying were people who went to the Bible to see whether these things are so. They went to Scripture, they studied it, they let the Scriptures speak to them, and they could see that what the church was doing was being faithful to the Bible. But those who let the Bible speak to them instead of Herbert Armstrong those are the ones who made the change. I move away all the literature from the church. So I would start begin zero, and I started reading the book of Romans, Galatians, Hebrews. And then suddenly it seems like somebody turned on the light. And I, I finally, you know, it was so clear, especially going through the book of Galatians. And I remember closing our room, closing my bedroom, and I was literally dancing. <laughs> so it's like this big weight just off me. And I was just so happy. And I would ask God to guide me and it didn't, it didn't feel confusing anymore. It just felt like the fog was, was lifted. It wasn't until the thought came to me, suppose this is of God and I'm rejecting Him. And that's what took me to my knees, and I, I talked to God about it. I said, if this is of you, I do not want to reject it. If, in fact, I do have a veil over my eyes, please remove it. And it was almost instantly after that prayer, as I read the Word, it was like reading a new book. But for me, it was just kind of like the veil had been lifted, and I could say, oh, yeah, that makes sense. Then when you reread the New Testament, it's amazing all the difficult scriptures we used to spend hours explaining away suddenly weren't difficult. They were like written in plain English. God's truth is revealed. Yes. When I found out quite clearly that the Holy Spirit is a person, I prayed and I said, Holy Spirit, I don't know you. <laughs>